it just be that. Okay. single most important operating system abstraction that we will look at this semester, although I don't know, it's picking between operating system abstractions is like trying to decide who's your favorite child, right? I mean, they're all, they're all special and wonderful in their own way, but I think this is a good place to start. We're going to talk about processes. We're going to talk a little bit about how processes can communicate both inside a process, we're going to talk about some mechanisms for inter-process communication, 
And then I'm going to go through a series of examples where I'm going to show you how you can find out some of the same information on your own machine using some standard Unix utilities. And we'll kind of see some examples of how processes are laid out and the type of abstractions they contain. Okay, so I want to start with a couple of announcements. The first one I wanted up here while people were coming in, but if you are not receiving email, on the CS421, CSE421 class list. Raise your hand. <coughs> I know a couple of you should have your hand up, Dale. Yeah. So if you would like to receive email, we will use this list for announcements about the class, if for some reason the class is canceled, if uh, there's something super exciting that's about to happen that I want to make sure everybody knows about, uh, we'll send an email over this list. So people who are registered for this class are required to be on this list. If you're registered for this class and you're not on this list, I'll try to fix that today. But in general, if you're here and you think you're taking this class for a grade and you're not getting emails over this list, please let me know because this is an important list that we're going to use for important stuff. You guys are losing in two weeks, New York. <laughs> yeah, going down. I'm sure. Yeah. We'll talk. Yeah. We'll talk. <laughs> All right. So um, let me start off with the mea culpa. So uh, let me see if this thing is going to work today. Oh. It would be good if I plugged it in. And good. Huh. that I like to do, but I really appreciate those of you who came and took the exam and the feedback is going to be really helpful for us in designing how we do the rest of the class. So thank you, and again, my apologies for the mix-up. I can promise you, however, that this kind of thing will not happen on the baseball or the final. This is a good chance for me to have some practice in getting an exam. All right, so let me do some announcements before I get started, just to make sure these don't fall off the end of the queue at the end. So, we have a mailing list. Like I said, if you're registered for the class, you should be on the mailing list, right? And we will keep this low traffic. This is just for really course-related announcements. It's important for people to have. If you need to contact the course staff, please email staff at mail.cse421.net. That comes to me and the other TAs, and it'll help make sure that you get a fast response. I tend to get, well, I wouldn't say I get a lot of email. I'm just not good with the email I get, so it feels like a lot of email. So if you send email directly to me, it will probably not be answered before it would have been had you set it to the staff email list because there's three, perhaps four other people that are on that list that will, on some level, have access to the same state that I will. All right, we have a web server that's up. If you're curious, you can go to the web server page. There's nothing up there yet. We're working on it. Hopefully today we'll have some content, including assignment zero. So we're working really hard to get assignment zero out. The goal is to have it out by the end of the day today so you guys can get started hacking. And probably if it comes out today, you know, we'll be making changes to it and updating you guys as things go along. So, you know, download it, take a look at it, set up your virtual machine, and, uh, but be on, be on the lookout for announcements about things if there's bugs that we missed. Okay? We are going to start the recitations for this class next week. So not this week. This week there will be no recitations. Next week we will start recitations. We are planning on holding office hours this week, but let me do a quick and useful poll about timing for recitations and office hours. So I noticed one of the recitations is scheduled at 8 a.m. Has anybody signed up for that recitation? Would you guys like to go to a different recitation that is not at 8 a.m.? Yeah, but my schedule probably won't allow us, but yeah. Okay. So why don't we do this over the course list, but I mean, I would, if we can get you guys into another recitation, then, then we may try to kill off the end of recitation. That seems, that seems pretty brutal. What are the other times? What's that? You know the other times? Yeah. But there's, I think there's, 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 there's sprinkled throughout the week, so there's one, at, I think at 4 p.m., there's another one at 10, 10 a.m., so. We'll, floor time, so. We will see. Right. Yeah, yeah. If you can't make it to another one, then we will do one at 8 a.m. And then finally, so we are good. The TAs are going to hold office hours for this class. Now, the interesting thing is this class is at 9 a.m. 
And since all of you guys will be getting up every morning to come to class, I was wondering if there would be any interest in having office hours after class. I know that that's a time that interferes with other classes you might be taking, but I figure as long as we're dragging you out of bed at 9 a.m., we might as well sweeten the pot a little bit by having the TAs around maybe one or two days a week after class to answer questions on the assignment. Is there any interest in this? If you're interested in this, raise your hand. All right, good. Because I think that's a good carrot for people to come to class. Now, however, there's one caveat. If you go to office hours and you did not come to lecture, we will somehow figure out who you are and we will make sure that you pay. Okay? So don't come to 10 a.m. office hours if you can't come to a 9 a.m. lecture. Right? If you need to sleep in, sleep in. That's fine. I, I'm not going to take it personally. We'll try to put some videos up on the web. That's why we're taping today. So on the other hand, if you, if you come to office hours and you want to help at 10 a.m. and you weren't able to get up at 9 a.m., then I, just, I think the TAs will be less interested in helping. Um, and we, but we will also schedule some PM office hours for people as well, because I know that people have different schedules. Okay. Any additional questions before we get started? All right. So to start out today, I want you guys to do something very simple. Everybody stand up. Okay. Turn to somebody nearby you that you don't know and introduce yourself. Say hi. Say good morning. The other thing is, if you are seated in a seat that has a number that is higher than 158, please get up and move into a seat that has a number that is lower than 158. People from the back of the classroom, please come forward. Plenty of room in the front row, guys. Processes and processes happen to be the OS abstraction that does not map down to hardware directly. Unlike threads, which map down to CPU, uh, virtual address spaces, which map to memory, and files and other file abstractions that map onto disk. Right? So processes are kind of an organizing principle. So we're going to talk about abstractions today, not multi right? And abstractions are designed to do a couple of things. Right? So before when I asked you how many people have used some sort of programming or system abstraction. Raise your hand again. Okay, that's better. Before it was like five of you, and I was thinking, do you guys write assembly code? You know, I mean, so if you've programmed in any kind of language, you've used an abstraction, right? Abstractions are designed in the operating system in particular to do a couple of important things, right? So let's see, what's one important thing that operating system abstractions do? Uh, simplifies the programmer's job. Right. So it makes it designed to make things easier for the program, right? It's easier to work with a file than it is to have to figure out how to write raw blocks to disk, right? It's also easier to let the operating system handle context switching for you than to figure out how to save your state and restore it. Now there are libraries that do this. So how many people have used a user space threading library? How many people have used threads on Linux? more than maybe four, maybe one or two years ago, then you've used your user space study library. So this is possible. But in general, the idea about abstractions is to, it's right, to simplify things for the program, right? What's something else that abstractions do? Uh, provide the interface for programs. Right, so abstractions have, have an interface, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a property of abstractions. But why, why do they have an interface? Let me go a little bit, yeah. Uh, to hide the underlying implementation, if underlying implementation Right. 
So one of the questions on the, the, the preterm that I think that there were some people that, that seemed to struggle with was this question, and maybe it was a trick question, because maybe, maybe the answer Im implied something about your fundamental uh, suspicion or um, uh, feeling of that operating systems are designed properly. But operating systems are designed to separate policy and mechanism, right? Not entangle policy and mechanism. Implementations that entangle policy and mechanism are, are tend to be pretty terrible, right? We're trying to stay away from those, right? Operating systems are really designed to do the opposite. They're trying to set the rate of policy, right? And in some ways, interfaces embody a policy, right? So an interface creates a contract between the caller and the callee that says, this is what the callee will do for you, and this is what you can expect, but other than that, you can't count on any other kinds of behavior, right? So when well-specified, interfaces allow the caller, sorry, the callee to do exactly what you just pointed out, to change the implementation. So can anybody think of an example of this kind of thing? In, in, maybe use an OS abstraction, maybe use a different abstraction, right? What about files? Is anyone, uh, what's the major shift that's going on in file storage technologies today? Cloud computing. Cloud computing, okay, cloud computing is a good one. I'm thinking of something else though. Flash, right? We can talk about both, right? Okay? Cloud computing and flash, right? What is different about flash and spinning disks? There's no seat time. So there's no moving parts, right? Flash is solid state, right? It's kind of like permanent memory. Now, when we get to the file system part of this part portion of this course, we're going to study, to some degree, not to a huge degree, because it's, it's kind of starting to be antiquated, a lot of the old tricks that file systems used to play to improve performance when disks spun around in circles, right? So what's one property of disks spinning in circles that's significant for file and file system design? Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine. If you don't know, just say that. Let me pick up someone else. But, right, locality matters, right? There's, this, there's this, such a thing as disk locality. So where the heads are, so the disk is this platter with these little heads moving around. It. And where the heads are at a particular moment in time has an impact on how long it will take to acquire a block of data from another part of the disk. Okay? Is this true on Flash? No, because there's no moving parts, right? Now, however, just, just because this comes back to another preterm question, locality is important on Flash, and that's because Flash wears out. Right? We'll come back to this, but Flash, so Flash has different properties than spinning disks, right? The nice thing is that despite the fact that there has been this big, there is this big change going on in storage technologies, the file abstraction that operating systems have provided to applications has remained the same. Right? The implementation has changed, the performance requirements have changed, and there's a huge amount of underlying change that goes on, but the fundamental abstraction is still the same. And at the very end of today's lecture, we're going to come back to another example where the Linux operating system kind of abuses, I shouldn't say abuse, cleverly reutilizes the file system abstraction to expose a different kind of information. Right? All right, so abstractions, right? Separating policy from mechanism, providing an interface that allows the mechanism to change, right? Okay, so over the course of the semester, we're going to talk about a number of these operating system abstractions. And as I mentioned before, most of these map directly down to heart, right? And these are the little pretty pictures that we're going to use to talk about these abstractions throughout the class, right? And hopefully they won't change that much unless I get fussy and decide to change them, which is entirely possible. It probably happened today. All right. So processes are the organizing principle that collects information about a number of different abstractions on the system. So if you think about what abstractions do, right, one of the things in my definition is organizing information. So a process gathers a lot of useful information into one container, right? And the fact that that information is there and that container has implications for how it's shared and how it's accessed. All right. So, you guys, you guys are familiar with processes, right? Other than files, processes are probably the operating system abstraction that most people are the most familiar with, right? So what's a process? Give me an example of a process. This is a very easy question. Process. Me? Yeah. Uh, when the application is running, the machine will create a process. So give me an example. A process that you used recently. 
process. I hear a lot of things. Linux? No. Operating system. Now process. Did you get that? What? No, no, no. That's What's that? Media player. Media player. Media player. Okay, great. Media player, right? Applications, you guys know you guys know processes as applications. Right? They've got windows, they've got buttons, they've got an interface, right? A lot of processes are application are user facing, right? So you guys know what these are, right? Give me another example of process. You guys over here talk about Process Explorer. Process Explorer, right? Ah, there we go. The meta process, right? Because they go and reverse it button. Okay, another example of process. Chrome. Chrome. Sure. Yeah. So the applications you use on your computer are processes, right? And, and that's, that's, this is the way to think about them, right? So, so what, do, what do processes integrate? So processes have things that are up on this slide, right? So let's go through, OK? Robert, tell me one of the things that a process contains. Well, it has a thread. A thread? One or more threads. No, stop there. You can't take two answers. Got to get somebody else. One or more threads, right? So what are threads? Threads are represent things that the operating system is doing, right? Threads of execution, things that are happening, right? We're going to go through an example of this in a minute, right? Something else an operating system contains. This is on the slide. These are easy questions. You and the Buffalo Bills. Uh, an address space. An address space. All right. I, I like that because it's kind of Patriots colors, almost. If I point hard. <laughs> um, an address space, right? So a process is using memory. Right? It's using memory for a variety of different things. Right? You can think of memory as temporary storage, right? temporary, fairly fast storage, right? ephemeral storage. Okay? Something else that processes use would, would, would be using you. Files. Files. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> this class so far is like reading comprehension, right? I mean, it's like, I promise I'm making this hard. We'll have some later where I have like little reveals on the slide. I'm getting better with my list. So, um, right, so operating system use files, right? Files are permanent storage, right? Permanent storage on disk that, that tends to survive reboots and process stops and starts and other things. Okay. All right, so processes on an operating system, besides collecting information and organizing abstractions, they also provide a protection boundary. So, to some degree, an operating system guarantees or tries to guarantee that multiple processes will not be able to stomp on each other, right? So if I launch a process on my system, it shouldn't be able to, you know, kill off other processes, make the system really slow and unresponsive, etc. Now, is, is this is always the case in practice. No, right? How many people are old are how many people here are old enough to use to have used like old versions of Windows like 95, 98? So, so Windows took about 30 years to discover stuff that Unix had invented in the 70s, right? One of those concepts was protection boundaries between processes. So old versions of Windows had all sorts of different ways that processes could stomp on each other and make life miserable for each other, right? New versions of Windows tend to have fixed these problems, right? But to some degree, this is a common theme that all operating systems share, right? Is that they try to make sure that processes can't stomp on each other. Now, inside of a process, that's your business, right? That's like your little private domain is the program, right? So an operating system is not going to guarantee that stuff that you do with your own resources within the process container are correct, are safe, are going to lead to your, your process behavior, right? But that's kind of the program response, right? So the operating system is essentially guaranteeing or agreeing to provide these kind of boundaries between different processes, and programmers are expected to do the work inside of that. All right, so in intra process, yeah. Uh, can you call virus a process? Excuse me? Computer virus. Would it be called a process? Because if it would be running, it crashes the computer as well. So, uh, right, okay. A computer virus would be a process, right? Computer viruses tend to be processes that exploit bugs in other processes, right? So a computer virus, what, what, is, what is the common, so at, at some point, a little trivia question for you guys, right? I can't remember which version was it, it was Vista, right? Microsoft Vista came out something like two or three years late, right? And then <coughs> nobody liked it, right? But 
And one of the things that slowed down <coughs> the launch of Vista, does anybody know what it was? Microsoft did a huge security audit of their entire code base, right? Where they pulled programmers off other projects and essentially had to read and do security reviews of this huge code base that they call Windows and, and other, other core services. And the reason for that was to try to prevent these sorts of problems, right? So a typical, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to my flow in a minute, but I'm answering the question because I think it's a cool question. A typical uh, privilege escalation, right? So does anybody, there are websites that record these, right? Does anybody follow this sort of thing for Linux? I don't really, but I think it's kind of neat. There are people that basically are, you know, what you might think of as white hat hackers, friendly hackers who go out and try to break Linux, right? So they try to find ways to uh, escalate their privileges. And what that means is they try to find ways to, to execute as the root user, right? Because the root user on a Linux system has special privileges and can do a lot of nasty things to other, it, root, to other processes and parts of the system, right? So basically what these people do is they try to find ways of running programs or exploiting holes in the operating system software so that they can then get more privileges than they were supposed to have, right? So typically on most systems, whether it's Windows or Mac or, or Linux, there, there is a special user that has privileges that allow it to do things with other processes that you might not normally like, right? And that's done for management purposes. If you can masquerade as that person, then you can do a lot of damage, right? Any other questions here before I go on? All right, so communication within a process is pretty easy, right? So if I have multiple threads, right? Someone give me an example of like a canonical multi-threaded application. Anybody have a guess? Let's start over here on the side of the room. Any guesses? Nothing. How about you? Cat programs, maybe? What's that? Maybe cat program? Like anything that has an interface, right? Frequently will utilize multiple threads to do different things, right? You have one thread that's redrawing the screen. You have one thread that's waiting for user input. You have another thread that's doing something in the background, right? What's an example of a server application divided by multiple threads? A web server, right? A canonical example, right? Threads within a process can communicate with each other directly, typically by just using memory. Right? So, you know, if thread one wants to communicate with thread three, it can just write into a shared memory region like key. Right? Some of this stuff we're going to come back to when we talk about memory. I'm just trying to give you some of the ideas of, of where the boundaries lie. Right? And process and thread three can read it. Right? So, again, in terms of communication, there's a lot of openness within a process itself. Right? This doesn't necessarily make things easy. Right? because there are a lot of synchronization problems when you start to have multiple threads, and we have something we will talk about in detail next week. Right? Communication between processes is harder and more structured. Right? Why is that? What's the thing that the operating system is trying to do for processes, between processes in the back? Yeah. What, what is, what, an operating system is trying to help, is trying to do what between processes? It's trying to, why, why would inter-process communication be more structured and more difficult than process within a process? Because you have more functionality. That, that's, that's one possible, it's not why I'm saying that though. Yeah. I'm trying to get a schedule of time to because there are a lot of processes, operating systems, want to watch <coughs> Right, so, okay, so there could be research out of problems, but I come into something more fundamental. The operating system is designed to keep its boundaries around its process. Right. The OS wants to protect processes from each other, right? And so communication between processes is one possible channel where my process might do something bad to your process, right? And so I need to find ways of kind of protecting these channels and setting them up in a way that's well structured, right? Most of these mechanisms require that processes coordinate explicitly. So for example, if I want to share memory between two processes, both processes have to set up that shared memory region, right? So it's an opt-in sort of thing. I can't just decide to share your memory, right? Like you're running along and I'm like, hey, I like that page. You know, I'm going to write some data into it. You know? That doesn't happen. That could happen inside of inside a process between two threads but it will not happen between two processes because both processes have to ascend to sharing that page, right? Older versions of Windows, this would happen, right? And that was one of the issues, right? Because, you know, there, there could be this kind of sharing that was unintended sharing and where one application was not cognizant, right? 
So here, here's one way that the processes can communicate with each other that maybe illustrates some of these problems. So this is a file that both of these processes have opened down here. And process A has written something to the file, and then process B could read it. So what are some of the problems with this? Anybody? Uh, actually, synchronization between the two processes. Right, so I need to have some semantics for how you and I are going to share this file. Right? I don't necessarily know if you're done writing data. I don't know where I can write data. Especially, so this is especially critical when two processes are sharing a file and trying to write to the file at the same time. Right? Because you know, if I write data and you write data to the file at the same time, it's essentially a race. Right? And whoever writes last, that's the data that's going to appear. How many people have used a file system like NFS? A network, a network one mounted file system. If any, I haven't used it, I heard about it. Yeah, so if you guys have used a shared computing environment, you've probably used something like NFS. So again, we'll come back to this in the file system unit, but NFS has very loose uh, requirements for how it opens and locks files. And that can create a lot of problems here because if you're not careful and two, you know, two users that are logged into different machines that are accessing the same shared file can essentially run into this problem. And the real issue on NFS is that NFS doesn't have a notion of a file being open. Right. Which, as you imagine, is kind of an issue because I can use openness to prohibit other people potentially from modifying the file. Right? So if I open the file with certain rights, that means that other processes won't be able to open it, and I know that I can write my data to the file without fear of somebody else stopping out. All right. Questions at this point? I want to go through a couple of other inter, inter process uh, communication mechanisms because this really kind of helps us get at the process abstraction. Right. So exit codes. When I started writing these slides, I was, it was, this is really interesting, right? So exit codes, it's so, it, like, I don't know, I'm fascinated by exit codes, right? It's just this teeny weeny little piece of data that processes can pass between each other, right? When a process exits, it returns an int. That's it, like a number that is, you know, supposed to indicate something about what happened, you know? What, did it finish properly? Did it crash, et cetera, et cetera. That exit code is available to the process that created that process. So on Wednesday, we're going to talk about process lifespan, fork, exact things like this. But the point is that a return code is one, one very, very limited form of IPC. It can only be sent when the process exits. It is only received, in most cases, by the process's parent. Right? So I, I threw in some examples here. The green's not showing up very well. But showing you, you know, how to uh, collect exit codes using Bash, right? How many people are familiar with Bash? I know I should know this because it's pretty dumb. Okay, so you've probably seen something like this. So, what I can see here, does, what does bin true do? Anybody know? <coughs> bin true. It's, it's kind of a funny program. You guys will, will learn more about this later. I'm surprised nobody here knows. Bin true returns zero. That's all it does. Right? It's the simplest, maybe the simplest possible Unix program, right? And again, Zero here is normally indicated, used to indicate success, right? Where non-zero indicates failure, and there's a lot of different ways that a process can fail, right? And a lot of time processes will establish fail codes. That means that if a process returned two, you look that up in some table and it says, you know, the process ran out of memory or something, right? What about bin false? What do you think bin false does? Should be able to tell. It returns one, right? Error, right? That's all these things do. So this shows you from the shell how this looks, right? So if I, if I uh, basically run a sleep command, which will wait for five seconds and then run bin true, when it completes, you see that it just says done, right? That's the way of the shell telling you it just completed okay, no problem, right? Bin false, however, you can see that it says exit one, right? That means that the process bin false exited with exit code. If you've run a command, and you don't know what happened, and you'd like to retrieve the exit code after the command finishes, bash has this special <coughs> variable, which is, I guess, a dollar sign followed by a question mark. Right? It simply says, and that will, if you, if you print that variable or echo that variable to the terminal, that will tell you what the exit code was that the process that just ran, it just finished, return. And this can be helpful, because sometimes you'll run something, and it won't seem to have done anything, and you'll want to kind of know what happened, did it work, did it not. All right, pipes, right? Pipes are another Unix IPC mechanism, right? So how many people have run a command like the one up there that have used the pipe operator, right? 
So pipes are a way of transferring data between processes, right? And again, it's another simple, fairly structured form of IPC, right? Linux sets up pipes as essentially a buffer between two processes. So all the output from my ps command will be written into a pipe where it can be retrieved by the grep command, right? And this is, again, another sort of standard way of doing IPC. And, if it's, and Unix has this design philosophy where, which, which maybe distinguishes it from some other programming environments that you're familiar with, where Unix likes to distribute a lot of small utilities that do one thing very well. And then it's your job as a programmer to chain them together to achieve something that you want. And I'm sure if you go online, you can find examples where people have chained together like six different commands using pipes to do something, right? So rather than writing a standalone program to do something specialized, you take special, you know, single purpose programs and kind of chain them together in a nice way. Right? And this is something you can do from the command line. And this is especially nice when you're trying to solve a problem that you think you'll never need to solve again. Right? You just need to solve it in that one moment. Right? All right, signals. Signals are another form of IPC that processes can, can engage in. And signals actually uh, have a lot of overlap with interrupts, which we're going to talk about later this week. So processes can, signals are an asynchronous device where another process can send a certain kind of signal to a, to a second process. That process has the option before the signal arrives of establishing signal handlers to process that signal, right? And a signal handler means when that signal arrives, that process will, be, will jump into a signal handler and execute a particular piece of code. So you guys have all, I, I bet anyone who has used Unix has used signals, right? Ha, raise your hand if you've used Unix or Linux. All right. Have you used signals? Have you ever have you ever exited a process? Yeah. How do you do that? Uh, and like if, I'm, if I'm just exiting like a program, I would just do it return zero. No, no, but, but let's say it's running and you want to stop it. Oh, signal. Ah, but how but how do you do that? Like if you're in, if you're in the terminal. Control C, right? Control C. Control C is implemented by sending a sig term signal to the process that's running, right? Most processes handle that signal by shutting down gracefully. You can write a process, however, that ignores Control C. If you write a process by default using the standard C libraries, Control C will shut down. However, you can write your own signal handler and you can write a process that if it runs, it will sit in a while one loop, and if you hit Control C, it will not stop. I don't know why you would do something like that, but it can be done. Right. And again, if you look up online, there's a whole bunch of different signals that you can send. Right. So here's an example of using kill. Right. Now, kill, despite its fairly aggressive name, is not just about killing processes. It also sends signals of of an arbitrary number of types. Right. So by default, kill will send sig term, but you can use kill to send any signal. And some of the signals don't kill the process at all. There are signals that tell the process, reread your configuration file. Right? So if I have a web server that's running, for example, and I've made some changes to the sites that I'm serving, and I don't want to have to stop it and restart it, I can send it a certain kind of signal that says, I've made some configuration changes. Could you reread them? Right? And if it handles that properly, processes can also ignore signals, as I said. SIG kill is one particular exception. Right? Processes are not allowed to ignore SIG kill. Right? SIG kill will terminate the process. Usually, fair and a fairly ugly gap. Questions? Okay, so what about signals? I mean, is this a safe mechanism? Can I just send a sig kill to your process? No. Why not? We don't know what other process are interacting with that. Well, it's not just that. It violates the protection boundaries that the operating system is trying to establish. <coughs> so normally, the way signals work is that I can only send a signal to one of my own a process that I have created that's associated with my user ID. If I try to signal some other process, the signal just doesn't get through. All right, so we're going to come back to a lot of these mechanisms when we talk about some of the specifics of memory, files, and, and other things. Right? All right, I just want to stop here briefly and talk a little bit about terminology. So there can be, at times, a little bit of confusion between processes and threads. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of terminology out there. What I'm trying to do is give, introduce you guys to a certain set of concepts that basically map down onto any operating system you use, right? 
Windows, like Windows is this whole different universe, right? But Windows has these ideas. Windows has processes, Windows has threads, et cetera, et cetera, right? Linux sometimes calls these tasks. So anyway, you're gonna be a little confusion. So processes and threads, partly the confusion is because we talk about a process running, we'll also talk about a thread running, right? In this class, processes are container abstraction that, and processes can be scheduled, which means that a thread that is, belongs to that process is running, right? But processes, have files, they have memory, they have threads, right? Threads encapsulate CPU state, just CPU state. That's how we're going to define things. <laughs> All right, so let me go through an example of a process, and we'll talk about some of the parts of the process and what they might do. Firefox, right? Unless you've been living under a ditch, I guess you don't live under a ditch, in a ditch, <coughs> uh, you know what Firefox is, right? So Firefox, ooh, the answer. Firefox potentially has threads, right? What would those threads be doing? Downloading data like a What's that? Speak up. Downloading data. Right, right. So Firefox will, will have, so when I looked at Firefox on my laptop using my, uh, you know, versions of Process Explorer top on Mac, it had something like 30 threads, right? Okay, so Firefox actually has a lot of threads, right? Firefox might have threads that are downloading data, so when you fetch a website, it might have a thread that does that, just, just is in charge of getting that website. What else might Firefox have threads doing? <coughs> Renders, right? Drawing, <coughs> drawing the screen. Drawing tabs, right? So I, I'm pretty sure that Firefox spawns off a separate thread for each tab, at least one, right? If you want to see Firefox you know, utilization go up, go and open like 80 tabs, right? This happens to me a lot when I work. Right? And then usually something has it, something requires me to shut down the whole thing. I've lost like a week's worth of state. So, um, okay, what else? What else might Firefox threads be doing? Drawing the page. What else? Plugging containers. What's that? Plugging containers. Plugging, yeah, plugging containers. Yeah, you can you can say that. Looking for updates. Looking for updates. Bookmarks. Running scripts. Running scripts. Listeners. Processing interface events. Mouse clicks, typing, etc. Okay, good. We got it. Oh yeah, no, no, no. This is common. We're just doing an example. Right? I just want to see people see what. Yeah. Bit of a deviation, but Chrome says it claims to be faster because it says each tab is a process by itself. I can't speak to Chrome. I don't use. It. I've got to, I'm one of these old fuddy duddies who have too much like mental energy invested in Firefox, can't move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so, what might, so Firefox is, is going to be using a bunch of memory, right? Now, what, what might Firefox be using memory for? What might be in Firefox's memory? Uh, it's extensions. Like it's, it's running the extensions, so it's loading them into memory. Extensions. Browsing history. I'm, I'm thinking more, I'm thinking a little lower level. I'm thinking more about. Using Timber for your web page cache. Uh, okay. So 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 I, I don't. So here's the thing. There's memory that we can identify from the outside, and then there's. You're right. These these are good answers. These are probably true. From the outside, though, let me give you some hints. So Firefox will have in memory its own code, right? It's kind of important, right? <laughs> it doesn't have its code in memory. I don't know how it's executing, right? Because that's how processes work. Fetch an instruction from memory, execute it, you know, decode it, execute it, change state, repeat, right? Firefox, okay, I'll, I'll do this one because this is a uh, Shared libraries, right? So most programs today are written to use shared libraries, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, right? But the reason for that is so that when those libraries get updated, you don't have to recompile every process on my system, which would be terrible, right? So on load time, the loader will map some of those shared libraries, which are files, right? But they end up being mapped into the process's address space because they're actually executable code that the process is executing, right? And then another example would be the heap, right? Dynamically and allocated memory, which is probably being used for the cache, it's probably being used for extension, storage, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's, and then what else? Firefox has threads. Threads have what? A stack, right? Local variable storage. All right. Okay, then files. Turns out Firefox doesn't actually have that many files open. At least when I looked. But what might it have files open for? Fonts. Did someone say fonts? No, the sockets. Oh, wait. I'm going to pretend you said fonts because that's a fantastic answer. I was surprised. It has font files open. I didn't think anyone was going to do 
so, so so I'm talking about I'm thinking about file files like disk files, right? Sockets, you're right. Sockets look like files in Unix, but fonts, right? What else? Configuration files, right? So Firefox loads its own configuration from the file. All right. So let me talk. I've got about ten minutes. So let me talk about how you find information about processes on your own system, right? So how many people have run top on a system before, right? Okay, cool. This is a pretty useful utility, right? This shows you a lot of information about what's going on in the system. Right? I ran this. All these uh, were run on our web server, right? Just in doing much right now. Um, but you can see, I mean, this gives you a picture of what's using the CPU, how much memory is allocated, how many. So again, Linux has the idea of a task, which is essentially something that's runnable, right? So a task can be either a thread with one. A process with one thread, or a thread inside a multi-threaded process. Right? So this says there are 58 tasks. Right? 50 percent, 57 of them are sleeping. What about these CPU states? What, what do you think some of those mean? 0.2 percent US. What is that? User space. Amount of time that the percentage of time that the system has spent executing user space code. S Y. And then I D. Right. So this, this machine's not doing a whole heck of a lot. All right? So let's go through an example of a process, bash, a simple shell, and, and we'll find out some information about it using these utilities, right? So the first thing I need to do is figure out what the process ID is. Every process on a system has an ID which allows the system to refer to it and allows you to refer to it, right? It's an index. So, you know, depending on what I want to do, I can use PS and I can grep the output. I can use pgrep, which is, I guess, People who were too lazy to do the first thing, and then I can also, if I know it's, if I know it's running local, right? When I log into the machine, Bash is the only thing that's running, so I can just run PS and I can see, right? So now I've got my process ID, right? And that's the beginning of the information I'm going to collect about the process, and I need that to collect other pieces of information. All right. All right. So now I could run PS with a little bit more detailed output, right? Now let's go through this together. Let's see. I want to find a road to go down right here. We're going to go this way. UID. User ID. Yeah, there we go. Next. Process ID. Process ID. PID. Paired process ID. Paired process ID. Good. Uh, let me go back. TRI. Priority. Yeah. Okay, put some mumbling over here. Go with you guys. SC. Okay, I'm um, sex. Signs. Signs, right? So it turns out that's the amount of memory that the process currently has. Well, actually, that's a good question. I, don't, I can't remember what that is. It's going to come up next, but so it will remind me. WCHAN. So that's kind of a description of, of if the process is waiting inside the kernel, which Bash is, what is it doing? Right? And it turns out that Bash is called wait. Right? Why did Bash call wait? Because it's waiting for PS to exit. Right? It's running a running a program when I ran this. Right, keep going. RSS. Uh, I don't know. Maybe something about size. So there, I think it's the, the resonant set size. It's the total number of pages that the, the, the process has mapped in its address space. Right? And I think SZ, if I remember correctly, is the number that are actually in memory. Right? And this is in kilobytes. So bash, as you would expect, is you know 3.7 megs of total, and it's only got 1.7 that are currently that are currently in there. Right? Right, keep going. Time. Some measure of how much time the process has been running. Right? And in this case, and actually I think that's, that's measured in actual time that's been scheduled on the CPU, which is why it's zero. Right? I just logged in and Dash hadn't run for very long. And Dash doesn't do much anyway. Yeah, question? If uh, like the process crashes, where is it the information that it recovered from? We'll talk about that Wednesday. Is that okay? Yeah, so the exit code is stored until the process parent reaps it. If the process dumps core, that's usually stored in a file in the directory. Right. All right, so again, here we go. Scheduling priority, core image of the process, et cetera. We want to do right? So also, if Bash had multiple threads running, this view would show those threads, right? It turns out Bash only has one thread, and we'll, again, we'll talk about this on Wednesday. It turns out that forking a thread, forking a process with multiple threads, it's a terrible idea. Right? It's really, really complex and ugly and nasty. Right? 
So Bash spends most of its day forking so that it can run other programs. So Bash does not have threads. Right? And you wouldn't expect it to have threads, right? It's just reading characters and figuring it out. All right. So I've got one thread in my process. Now, on the other hand, somebody said this before. What's a process that has multiple threads? Somebody said it. I mean, this is this CS421 web server. web server. The web server, right? So here we go. Apache. So this is Apache. If I run PS, I can see there's my process ID. And then if I show the threads, this actually has like 17 threads, right? On Linux, threads are known as lightweight <coughs> processes. So that's what that LWP is, right? Each one has a unique ID, and they can be scheduled independently. But these are all threads that belong to a single process, right? All right, so let's look at PMAP. Now, keep, actually, when I started writing this lecture, I hadn't used this tool before, but it's kind of cool, right? PMAP will show you the memory map, uh, some description of the memory that's in use by the file, right? And a lot of it isn't very helpful because, for example, if I allocate heap and then I use it for, like, Firefox configuration files, I, it's impossible to tell, right? All I can tell is that the, the process allocated to heap, right? So again, here's, here's Bash, right? Bash has its code, that's good, right? Now, why do you think there's, so Bash has, actually has its code mapped three times, right? With different permissions. Why is that? Anybody? So the first, the first segment is marked read and execute. What do you think that is? What's that? The one you're currently in, that short term over there. That's, so that's the code, right? That's the immutable code, right? It's executable because I'm executing it, and it's read only. I can't write. So, so there are there is a history of people that wrote, that wrote self-modifying programs that would modify their own code as they ran. That has typically been decided to be a bad idea, right? So most now today, by default, code segments get marked as read only, right? What's the next? It's just read, right? A portion of Bash's code has been marked just read. What could that be? Documentation. It's uh, yeah. It's like critical part of the code that cannot be modified by the user. So it so it can't be modified because it's read only, but it's also not executable. This is where programs store static variables, right? A variable that's never going to change, or some portion of the code that's not executable, but it's never going to change, right? The variables that get set, you know, that get set inside the executable file and never going to change. And then the last part is RW. What is that? What's that? No, I know it's read write. Read write. Good. <laughs> yes. What is it? What's in there? Global variables. Global variables. Exactly. Static global variables that you allocate in a program go in this area, right? Because they're read and written from. But they're not heap, right? Heap we dynamically allocate using mount, right? You can also see that Bash is using some libraries. This is libc, right? Imagine it's using libc, right? I guess I'm guessing that like 99.99% of programs running on this machine use libc, right? And then at the very end, I've got one thread and I've got one stack. And it turns out if you compute the address there, that is at the very, 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 very tippity top of the virtual address space of the process. I'm going to come back to virtual address space in a couple of weeks. All right, so I've got my address space, and I have to put every name in here, but I've, I've kind of tried to make it a little realistic. All right, fin final tool, LSOF. And, and this actually can be kind of a helpful tool. I've used this a few times. This will show you files that are open by a, per a particular process. Right? And what this shows you is that Bash has uh, file handles that point to the console, standard input, standard output. This is how it reads and writes characters. And then it's configuration file. Except for the fact that I made that up. Because when I ran LSO up, there was nothing interesting open. Right? But I just decided, hey, you know, I'm sure when we start bash, it reads this configuration file. So I just pretended that I caught it right at the right moment. Right? It was actually reading. And, uh, you know, it was, I beg your forgiveness, but it made for a good thing. All right. So, so this is it, right? and this is, this is again, I, I, hope I've, I, I hope I haven't bored you to death, but I hope I've given you some idea of the components of the process and, and how they're working. So I want to make one quick remark before we leave, because I, I think that this is kind of cool. So how do these programs that we've just used, PS, top, 
you know, PMAP, LSOF, how, where do they get this information from? So it turns out that Linux does this interesting thing where it exposes this information through a file system interface. So what I've shown here is, I, I guess I didn't show map. Okay, if you run map on a Linux machine, and you guys will be able to do this later today when we start using our virtual machine that you're going to use for the class because it's going to run Linux. You see that the proc file system is mounted on slash proc. And the proc file system is not a real file system, right? It looks like a file system. Again, I can go in here. So this was my shell, 7615. And if I look, if I do ls inside my shell directory under proc, there's all these files that contain interesting information. And if I had space, I would have showed you kind of what's in one of them, right? But this is all fake. The operating system creates this on the fly, right? And as needed in response to things changing, right? So this is not implemented by writing files onto the file system, right? This is implemented by intercepting file system calls and doing the right thing, right? So when ls asks, what's in this directory? The operating system intercepts that call and populates it with information appropriate to this particular process, right? And if I would display these files, it does the same thing, right? So this is kind of a neat example of how I can use this hierarchical file system model to organize other pieces of information, right? So this is something that, that operating systems do. And actually, on operating systems today, there are a lot of what people think of as file-like objects, right? Sockets, you know, network-based files, you know, the proc file system, et cetera. Yeah. So it creates like its own file system for each process? That's right. right. Well, so under proc, under slash proc, if you did an ls under slash proc, you would see that there's a directory for every process on the system. And they're all by process ID. But, but again, those calls into the kernel, there, there's no real file, right? There's no, like, if you looked, let's put it this way. There are no disk blocks that are holding this information, right? All the information is in memory somewhere. It's probably being cached so that the operating system doesn't have to rebuild it every time. But, but these files don't map onto disk blocks at all, right? They're completely constructed to allow processes to retrieve this information in a, in a well-structured way, right? Otherwise, if, so, so Mac, for example, doesn't have this, right? It has a Unix-like operating system, but it does not have prop. And what that means is that Mac tools that display this information have to make these kind of funky system calls in order to retrieve the information directly from the kernel rather than just navigating prop. All right. We're done. Do you guys have any questions? So on um, what? Yeah. So let me let me talk quickly about next week. So next, yeah, next week. I wish. Um, yeah. So what what available? Yeah. So I'm going to start putting putting my slides up onto the website. The, the slides are all HTML. So I. Putting them on the website is not a hard problem, but the website needs to exist and kind of do something useful for it. These slides will find their way up on the web as fast as possible. Right? My first priority today is to get the assignment out, so maybe not for a day or two, but this will be up there. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about the process lifecycle. Right? We're going to talk about where processes come from, you know, and the different the portion of the operating system interface that we use to manipulate files. No, processes. That's it. All right, we'll see you on Wednesday.